scriptures that will become evident to us and that picture of of who we are in comparison to who you are will be made clear and then as we can understand your greatness i just pray that you will understand help us understand how we fit into that and because of your greatness what it is that you have to offer us in jesus name amen It's, it's interesting how we look at, is this your music, Sarah? I'm going to move it. Otherwise, it's going to come down with me when I'm done. I'm moving it to Kevin's spot here. Uh, it's interesting when we look at, at life and the way we go through our lives, we find that there's a number of things that come into our being that, that we call great 
you know, that, that we esteem as, wow, that was really great that this happened or that that happened. I've, I've heard some already just in these past few days, maybe day, day and a half, two days, uh, how great it is that the Minnesota Vikings picked up Sam Bradford. Because obviously the other choices that we had as quarterback were not so great is really what I'm, what I'm hearing there. And you can't really argue with that too much. So as we get started this morning, I want to I wanna have us look at some of the great things that we see in our world and in our culture. So, so this, is, this is interaction time. And so I'm going to show a picture. I'm going to show a slide. And then I'm going to ask for some response. Um, Daniel, would you help me out? Hello, Mitch. Nice to see you. Daniel, Daniel, would you help me out? I left my water over there. I'm going to need that this morning. Thank you, Daniel. I picked a young spry person because we don't, the rest of us, we don't want to get up. You know, we're, we're totally content. Thank you so much. Yeah, old and forgetful, and I can't hardly talk. So anyway, I'm going to show you some pictures, and as I show you these pictures, I'm going to have to have some interaction, and you're going to have to tell me what it is that's so great here. Hold on. If I spill this, I'm sorry. It's just water. It's not like as much as we spilled at the baptism service. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. Help me out. The Great Pyramid of, who knows? Giza. Giza, very good. I'm very impressed that you guys know that. Uh, what's fascinating about the Great Pyramid, and we call it the Great Pyramid of Giza, Why? It's the biggest, right? Okay, so we're going to see this association here with this idea. But the Great Pyramid of Giza was like, for 3,800 years, was thought to be the tallest building in the world. For like 3,800 years. That's a long time to be the tallest building in the world. And it was built right around 2,560 B.C. So this is before the time of Exodus. Just a little bit of interesting history. How about this one? Reef. Very good. The Great Barrier Reef. Ah. Isn't that beautiful? And of course, we can't forget, it's the home of <laughs> Nemo, Marlon, Dory, Nigel, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, which reminds me that, you know, Gene Wilder died this week. Anyway, <clears throat> the Great Wall. Oh, see, this is where you're wrong. What we're looking for here is the, <laughs> the, the Great Wall Chinese restaurant. And, you know, being so local, you really, you should have gotten that one. And I... Uh, I'm a little disappointed that you, that you missed that one. Of course, it is the Great Wall of China. And again, it's called the Great Wall of China because it is so big. How about this one? Oh. Yes. Has anyone ever been eaten by a great white? Not yet. Not yet. Give it time. I remember as a child, I had this, this fascination with sharks, but yet this fear of sharks. And I, you know, I don't know. I had been to the ocean maybe once, and it was the Gulf, so it wasn't a great white shark, of course. And these are... Ooh, who can name them? I know many. You think so, Isaac? What? Okay, what's this one? Why is it superior? It's the biggest. Okay, this one? Okay. This one? Here, I'm very good. That was one of the tricky ones. This one? Erie and Ontario. Very good. Very impressive. All right, those are the Great Lakes. Oh, what's this? Great Britain. You guys are on top of it, except for the whole Great Wall of China one. You, you, uh, you kind of messed that one up. All right, what about this? Man, Pam, you are just on fire. Uh, several of you, I think, were around for the Great Depression. Sorry. Sever not you. I'm not, I'm not. Mark was. What about this? There it is. Yes, the Great Gatsby. Okay. I am the greatest. And it's fascinating when we look at this. Obviously, Muhammad Ali, you know, he may have just been talking about boxing, but he may have been talking a little bit broader than that, too. But you look at, yes, he was a great fighter. And, and was he the, the greatest? Maybe in our modern, modern days, modern era, he would have been the greatest boxer. But is he, in fact, the greatest? And I have to disagree with Mr. Ali in his personal assessment because we have something so much greater that we're going to be looking at this morning. And it's just, I, I pray and I hope that you guys, as you look at the scriptures, and we get this picture of who God is, that we're going to see him in all of his greatness, and that's going to affect us. It's going to affect our hearts. It's going to affect the way that we look, not only at him, but also in ourselves, and so that we will come to this greater understanding of our role and our association with that. So last week, we talked, believe it or not, we actually started talking about this idea of the church, and I know we started with who are we as individuals, and we looked at this, this comparison that we have to come to this idea of, of who we are, and we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, and in Ephesians chapter 1, we see this language, this beautiful language where God says, 
I have chosen you, and not only have I chosen you, I have adopted you. So in other words, what that does is it kind of separates us out. Before that choosing, before that adoption, we were not part of it. You know, and you look at the adoption process, you have a child who does not have a home, he does not have somewhere where he belongs, and you have these parents that come by and say, yes, I will choose to adopt you. And we talked about it last week, it's just an amazing, beautiful picture. And so you have these parents that come and say, yes, I will adopt you. And what that means is I'm taking you, you no longer have no place, now you have a place, and that place is with me. And so there's this adoption. Now you have been chosen, you have been selected, you have a place, you've been adopted into this family. And we're going to see this happen and this kind of occur here this morning that we're looking at this idea where God, who has chosen and has adopted us, now all of a sudden we have a place where we belong and he's selected it to be called the church. And we're going to look at what that looks like and how we progress and move into that. And we talked then also last week, because of the fact that we've been chosen, because of the fact that we've been adopted, we have value. You know, it's not about what you can do. It's not about your talents. It's not about your musical abilities or lack thereof. It's not about how much money you put in the offering plate each week or how much money you don't or can't afford. That has nothing to do with your value. We talked about this last week, that your value comes from the simple fact that Jesus Christ chose you, and because he chose you and has adopted you, you have value. That's the way it is. That's what the scripture teaches. And so we have to get away from some of those other uh, thoughts that lead us to think, well, I have no value because I can't do this, that, or the other thing. Well, the opposite is true when we look at what the scriptures say. And so we looked at that through Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through through 18. Well, this morning, we're going to continue with Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to look at specifically how it starts to portray who God is and the place that God holds in relation to this fact that we've already talked about. He's chosen us and he has adopted us. And so what we're really looking at is this idea of belonging. We're looking at this picture actually of membership. You know, so Paul in the book of Ephesians, he's, he's really dealing with this idea of you become members. And we see this through Paul's writings all the time. We become members of the body. And we have to look at what this body is. And this body is, in the scriptures, defined as the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And so we're looking at this idea of church membership and what that means and what that looks like and how we can be involved in that. And when we think of church membership, oftentimes we, we, we have people with varying opinions on it. Uh, sometimes, some people are very positive about church membership. Some people are very negative about church membership. And some people are just neutral. You know, and, and all of those you can find and, and see and understand a little bit where they're coming from. But I want to emphasize this reality. Despite your view on church membership, we have to come to this real, reality, this understanding that the church is not a place or a building. You know, we hear those words all the time. But you have to understand the church is the people. It's a people. And we see that and saw that last week when we looked at Ephesians. He starts choosing people. He didn't specifically say, I choose this building and then I'm going to bring some people into this building because this is my church. No, he built his church upon the rock. He he tells that to Peter, a person. And the people interact with people and they form this body of Christ. If a tornado came through and destroyed this church building, it would be no less the church that we have here. We'd just be meeting somewhere else is really what it would be. The church would be unaffected by some kind of a catastrophic destruction as of such. So your value, which has been placed on you by Jesus Christ because he has chosen you, and now you have value not only as an individual, but we're going to look at it broader than we're going to look at this value that he has placed on the church. And the greatest pursuit, we talked about this last week, the greatest pursuit is to know Christ. Not to know about him, but to know him and to know him better and better and better. And so as we get going, I want, to, I want you to understand, so we look at this book of Ephesians, and Paul in this book of Ephesians really lays out, kind of continually here and there, this idea that we are in a battle. And I think we've misunderstood what that battle means. You know, sometimes we, I, it always bothered me as a child, this, the song, you know, Onward Christian Soldiers, and I May Never March. I, it bothered me because it was like, man, it seems like war, and I don't really want to go to war, you know. And what I, one of the things that has happened, I think, in churches, whether here or elsewhere, one of the things that's happened in churches is we see it as a battle, but we've chosen the wrong enemy, you know. So look at this in Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll get to this in, in, in future weeks, but it says for our struggle, I like to, some, some versions will use the word wrestling. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of wrestling, so I usually like to use the word wrestling. But for the sake of what this says today, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's important to note, all right, our battle is not with each other. Okay, our battle is not with flesh and blood. 
Our battle is with these heavenly realms, as it's put, but the darkness that exists there, and we forget it. We absolutely forget it. When we, I understand there's going to be conflict. I'm not saying everything's going to be hunky-dory all the time. Just look at any marriage, and you'll see that there's conflict, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah what did Chris do this morning? That's right. Shame, shame. But we've, we've missed this reality, okay? Your mother-in-laws are not your enemy. It's important to know that, okay? And likewise, your spouses are not your enemy. There's days when maybe you feel like it, but that is not the reality of what we're looking at. Brothers and sisters, they are not your enemy, children. Non-believers are not our enemy, and that's one that we've struggled with time and time again. It's interesting. So to help us maybe grasp this, to help us understand this, I want us to look at a couple passages of Scripture. Uh, obviously, again, before we're getting into Ephesians 1, but Ephesians 2 is going to lay this out. This is kind of this idea, we were there. All right? We talk about non-believers not being our enemy, but yet we find ourselves in conflict with the values that they hold and the values that we hold, and so we find ourselves struggling with this idea. Well, this should help us to understand and point us in the direction of understanding, because look what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, this is referring to us, the church, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In other words, before you came to know Christ, you were as good as dead. You had no hope. You had no future. You were dead because of your transgressions and your sins. That's who you were. All right? And then it says, in which you used to live. In other words, this is part of the past for these Ephesians who have chosen to follow Christ. This is part of their past. When you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, this is Satan, the spirit is who, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So in other words, what you see is you have this contrast. Okay? Don't forget, in other words, uh, Paul is saying, who you used to be. Okay? You used to be a follower of darkness. All right? Before you chose to accept this invitation, to accept this adoption that Christ has, has offered to us, this is who you were. You know, some people will say, well, I've been a Christian all my life. I don't think the Scripture teaches that. All right? I think that the Scriptures teach something opposite. In fact, if we look at this and this next passage, okay, let's not forget verse 3 here, and then we'll move on. Uh, all of us who lived among them at one time, in other words, every one of us belonged there. We lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Some translations refer to this as we were children of wrath. In other words, God has his wrath when it comes to sin. He can't you cannot tolerate it. There will come a day when sin must be destroyed, eliminated. And if you have not chosen to follow Christ, you are, as, as some translations put, a child of wrath. In other words, this is where God's wrath is focused on, is on the sin. And that's hard to swallow sometimes for us, but that's a reality. Before we've chosen to follow Christ, that's who we are. But thank God, from what we read about and talked about last week, how he chose us and how he adopted us. For, and all we have to say is, yes, thank you. I accept your invitation to become a part of the family. And then we are no longer an object of his wrath. We're no longer a focal point of his wrath because sin has been destroyed. We're going to see that as we go this morning. So then 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, even if our gospel is veiled, or says, we have this truth. So even if our gospel has, a, has this curtain on it, okay, you can't see through it, all right? It is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, those who have not yet said yes to Christ, there's this veil in and they can't see it. And sometimes when we look at non-believers as our enemy, we're not comprehending or understanding this reality, they can't see it. And we get so frustrated with our culture, all right? We get so frustrated with our educational system. I'm going on my little soapbox here. Because sometimes we look at things it's like there is no fear of God in the schools anymore. There's no fear of God in the workplace anymore. And we find ourselves frustrated with it. And we lash out sometimes at the schools and at the administration. But we've picked the wrong enemy is really what it ends up being. Because they have been veiled. And that's what the enemy's job is to keep people veiled so we can't see the truth of the gospel. The God, small g, interesting to note, important to note, of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Oftentimes when we have taken, we have, we have tagged people as the enemy, the enemy of God. And in a sense, they're acting as such, but we have to remember that they have been veiled, that they have been blinded to this gospel, they've been blinded to this truth. This is a spiritual realm thing. This is not a human thing. This is a spiritual realm peace 
Satan's strategy is to enslave the world, is to blind us, is to take things that God intended for good and to twist them and manipulate them and make them seem something that they are not. In other words, he takes the truth of things like, let's say, sports. Okay, sports, for the most part, competitive. I mean, you saw it in the Olympics. You know, you saw some amazing signs of sportsmanship. Uh, Sarah was the one. She pointed this on out to me. There was this tennis match. Did anyone see this tennis match? Okay. Tennis match. The guy serves the ball. The official calls it out. And the, his opponent is standing there and says, you know, they, they, he's waiting to serve. He says, that was in. You can challenge that if you want to. You know, and, and the guy says, no, that's okay. And he says, no, go ahead and challenge it. It was in. You know, it's just fascinating. But yet you see this idea of, of sports in the sense of it wasn't just about winning. It was about something deeper than that. I'm not making any kind of spiritual ap- application necessarily in sports, but there's this idea the enemy takes this idea of, of athletics, of sports, and he makes it, he twists it into something that it was never intended or good to be. Same thing with food. We all need food. But there's times where the enemy will take this idea of food and he will twist it, and we suddenly use food for something it was never intended to be used for, you know, like food fights. Okay, I'm joking with that. But we, we take it and we'll, we'll use it as a stress reliever or, you know, we'll, we'll gorge ourselves on it. And it's, it's, it's Satan attacks us in such ways where we find food as, oh man, that's my comfort, as opposed to just something that f- fuels me and nourishes me, something that I need into something that was never intended to be. And we can see these same truths being applied with, with work. We all, you look at, at even in the, the Old Testament, when God created Adam and Eve, work. He put Adam in the garden to work it. It's not like God intended to create man and woman without any uh, responsibilities. There was work involved. However, that work changed with the fall. And Satan takes it and looks at it, and, and he twists it for us where like, all work is bad. And that's not the case. We find that there can be great uh, value and satisfaction in doing our work to glory and the honor of our Lord. He's twisted things like sex. We see it in the media all over the place. He twists it into something it was never intended to be. The world has become so blind, but we have to remember that our battle is not against the blind, but it's against the blinder. You know, it's interesting. Our world tries to get us to grasp at nothingness. You know, we, we read in Scripture sometimes where our life is but a vapor, or it's, it's like it's, it's foolishness. It's a chasing after the wind, as Solomon writes. Okay? It's, it's this... It's this nothingness. And it's interesting, at the, at the conclusion of Ecclesiastes, if you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, the whole book is designed as this great big experiment where Solomon goes out and tries everything under the sun, he says, to try to find some form of satisfaction, some form of fulfillment, and he finds nothing. Everything is meaningless. Everything is empty. And yet our culture convinces us that we can still achieve something. We can still do that if we just do this, that, and the other thing. If we have sex, if we wear the right clothes, if we um, are engaging in the right foods, the right alcohols, whatever the case is, we can find that kind of fulfillment. But what we find is still, as Solomon learned thousands of years ago, we find emptiness. We find nothingness. In fact, he came to the conclusion of, after he had tried all of those things, he said, there's really only one thing to be said. And it's that to fear God and obey his commands. It's just fascinating. And Solomon, and he was very wise. I mean, it's not to be misunderstood. In all of his wisdom, he could look at these things and understand that that's all emptiness, and there's something better, and the only thing that's better is God, and to fear him and to obey his commands. But this is what Christ was crucified for, was in a sense this lie that we could find something better. You, know, you look at the, the New Testament when they, when they crucified him, they didn't, that's not what they wanted. They didn't want Christ. He was rejected and thus was crucified. So they were looking for something better, even though they knew that the Messiah was coming. They said, yes, you're not it. You're not, one, you're not the kind of Messiah we want, so we're going to crucify you. That's the same thing that we exist and we wrestle with in our world. So we get into Ephesians chapter 1. And so we're going to look at here verse 17. I know we hit 17 and 18 last week. We're going to continue it again because it's going to warm us up and get us back into it. So he says, Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom. Remember, we just talked about Solomon who had this wisdom to be able to know what is good and what is not good and was able to see that this is emptiness. This is, he called it for what it was, and this is junk, a comparative. 
He said, this is, there's no satisfaction in this. So may the Spirit give you wisdom and revelation so that you will know him better. And the key point we talked about last week is you cannot know Christ without the Holy Spirit. You can know about him, you can read it and such, but you cannot know Christ without the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know him better, it's got to be the Holy Spirit's work in you. And then verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart, remember we talked about this, the eyes in the scriptures, the eyes of their heart, really is, is this window, okay? In the morning, I like mornings. I'm a morning person. So when I get up, I like to open the curtains and to let the light in. Except now it's getting dark, you know, it's still dark when I get up. But you open the curtains and you let the, the light in. You know, and there's this picture. So when, when you open the curtains, you can see what's existing and what's happening. You can look out and you can see if there's a sunrise. You can see if this is, a, this is going to be a beautiful day. And almost have that hope that lays out for you when you open the, the curtains. And this is what we have here. It's just like, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In other words, may be opened so that light can shine through in order that you may know the hope which he has called you to. If you keep the curtains closed, you can never see what's going on on the outside. And so he prays, open it up and look at the hope that's being offered to you. And it's the hope that he's called you to, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, verse 19, we're going to hit this. Pay close attention because this is is one of the pieces that I really want you to grasp here this morning. An inheritance of his holy people and his incomparable great power. All right? There is no power that compares with God's power. But you got to grasp the next two words, for us. Okay, here's the reality. You have Jesus Christ, you have all of his great majesty, you have all of his power, and he's, he's more powerful than we can ever imagine. All right, we think of powerful things in this world. Yep, we got some power, nuclear bombs, etc. And this just does not compare to the power that Christ has. But look at what it says here. He says, and by his incomparable, incomparably great power for us who believe. What this is saying is that we have the power and we don't live like we have power. A lot of times, if we look at our lives, we look at day to day, we think, oh, I got, I got nothing. And, and it, it, on your own, you don't. Because that spirit or that power comes from the Holy Spirit. But what we're going to see here this morning in the scriptures is the Holy Spirit lives in everyone who has chosen to believe and follow Christ. No matter whether you've just chosen to follow Christ yesterday or you chose to follow Christ 20 years ago, you have the same power in this Holy Spirit. And we're going to see other supporting scriptures. So that same power, he gave him the mighty strength. Okay, Ephesians 1. He exerted this power. All right, that's the same power that we just talked about here. Okay, and compared great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. That same power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ, rose Christ from the grave is the same spirit that it says that you have living inside of you when you say yes to Christ. It's the same spirit. It's the same power that comes with that Holy Spirit. And it seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. You see that? Seated him at the right hand. So you have this Jesus Christ who's now been seated at the right hand. This is like the, the, the highest place he could be exalted in honor in the heavenly realms, and you have him who is over all things. We're going to see that here as we go on this morning. And he's given us that kind of power. And what do we do with the power? We've got to ask ourselves. Romans 6. One of the interesting things here, when it says that that it's the same power that raised Christ from, from the dead, our greatest enemy... If you think about it in our lives, you go throughout your lives, you have some, some enemies. It's, it's bound to happen, okay? The Green Bay Packers. Uh, you have enemies in, in, let's say, you know, depending on what, what political party you associate with, maybe your enemy is the Republicans, maybe your enemy is the Democrats. We have enemies. But we look at, at this, the reality of when we go through our lives, our greatest enemy, the, the one enemy that's all common between all of us that we all try to avoid is death. You know what I mean? Okay, we all have this enemy. There's, where there's one showstopper, if you will, and that's the idea of death. So look at what it says here in Romans 6. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Okay? Well, he died once. You, you can't, I mean, it's, it's one of this, it's almost like this invincible hero that has resurfaced. Like you can't, you can't touch him. There's no stopping him because he died. Well, that didn't work. He's back again. What do we do now? Well, you can't kill him. That's already happened. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death, he died. He died to sin once 
for all, but the life he lives, he lives in God. And then in verse, uh, chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if only for this life, oh, catch this, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, all, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, what it's saying is, if your hope is only for this world, you're missing out. That's what Paul's saying. There's something so much better, so much better than what we experience here. And yet what we find is we're, we hope for things in this world. You know, we were hoping hard that the Vikings would make a trade to find a quarterback that was worthy of something. We hope that they did it. But we look at that in comparison, the hope that we hold on to in this world is to be pitied. Look at this, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen. In other words, he was the first to do that. And we have been promised them that same resurrection, that same power that exists there is the same power that exists in us, and we will be raised when we have chosen, said yes to Christ on the day that he comes back. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, we will, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits. Again, he was the first to die and be resurrected, and now we will be resurrected. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion. Catch this. He has destroyed all dominion, all authority, all power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. You've got to think about this. We have world rulers. All of them will be put under his feet. I know what you're thinking. We have, we have an election coming up in November. It doesn't matter who's elected. They will be under his feet. They will be. They have no choice. Okay? And I'm just as stressed as some of you are, I'm sure. But they will be put, all leaders, all rulers in this world, despite, despite how important they are, despite how important we make them, despite how important they think that they are, they will be put under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed, here's what we started this with, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. He exerted... This is the same power he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms. That same power will destroy death for all who have chosen to follow Christ. Jesus defeats everything. So what is in, verse, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, we see this. So what does it mean that he ascended? We just saw in this, this previous verse here, okay? So he ascended in the right hand in the heavenly realms. Here's what it means. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly reigns. Some people will take this and they take this down the wrong path. Some, some say, well, this is the evidence, and I'm not saying this is not evidence, but this is, the, they'll say, this is the evidence that Jesus descended into hell. That is not what this passage is getting at. What this passage is saying is that he ascended, meaning except that he also descended the lower earthly reigns. That means that he, as God, was sent down to earth. That's what this passage is referring to. He who descended to earth is the very one who ascended higher in all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Higher than everything. In this world, you have some trouble. Keep that in mind as we progress, okay? But we have a God right now who has ascended higher than everything. In other words, everything has been destroyed under him. Ephesians chapter 1, here we go, verse 21. There's only 23 verses in chapter 1 of Ephesians, so some of you are getting very excited. Verse 21 says this, far above, this is how he ascended, he was ascended far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. In other words, all the rulers, past, present, and future, will be under who Christ is. We look at some of the great, think of it this way, Mount Rushmore is under his feet. Some of our country's greatest presidents, these, you know, you got a guy like Abraham Lincoln who was just Obviously, most of it was hindsight because he was a very volatile man. Many people hated him, but that was because of the contrast in the North and the South. But you look at someone like that, and we look back and we esteem what a great president. What would, wouldn't be so great to have another president like that? Sure, but he's still nothing but a footstool to Christ and all of his greatness. 
I mean, do, you, do you see that? I mean, that's literally, Jesus stands on top of, as a footstool, places like Mount Rushmore, that we exalt some of these leaders. They can't hold a candle to Christ. The so past, present, our current leaders under it. Anyone we decide to elect in November will be under his feet. What we do, what I do, what I struggle with, we take things in our lives that we feel are big deals. And they are, okay? In our, in our world, they are. I'm not trying to diminish that. So we take things like our family. That's a big deal, okay? And we tend to exalt those things in our lives up to this point where if something ever happened there, I got nothing. You know, or exalt my, my children. Man, if something ever happened to my children. I was thinking about this just last night. You know, with this, I never thought I'd see the day when they found Jacob Wetterling's body. I mean, I, I'm, I'm old enough, uh, Chris is not, to remember the day when, when Jacob was, was taken. You know, I remember that. And I remember it several reasons. I remember one, because my, my younger brother was the same age as Jacob was at the time that, that Jacob was taken. And my son Isaac is only about a month away from that same age. And it's just, it, it resonated more now than it even had then. But you look at the loss Okay, that's a big deal. I'm not diminishing the fact that that's a big deal. The pain and the sorrow, I can't, I can't emphasize how, how hard that would be. But what we do sometimes, we take this idea, this big thing, and we put it over Christ. In other words, like, okay, here's Jesus. I know, I know you love me. I know you care for me. But this is bigger than you can handle. We do it. All right, sometimes it's with our finances. If we're in such difficult you know, financial turmoil, maybe because of just bad decisions we've made or just the fact that things, circumstances have just gone sour, we take those and it's like, oh, you think, you know, I know you love me, Jesus, but you can't handle this. And we take it and we, we flip the order and we put those things above Christ. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's our bodies. Maybe it's disease, things that we're struggling with, or loved ones that are struggling with it. Maybe it's the pain that we, that we suffer. It could be our job. It could be our home. When things go wrong with our home, it's like, oh, my goodness, what in the world are we going to do with this? How, I can't afford to fix the house. I can't afford to fix the roof. And we take and we flip-flop. And I'm not saying Jesus is going to suddenly come down with a hammer and nails and start reshingling your house. That's not exactly what I'm getting at. However, crazier things have happened. And you'd be surprised as to how Jesus might, might help you in that situation. But what I'm getting at is we have a God, and the scriptures say everything is at his feet. Everything is at his feet. Okay? All of your biggest troubles, your concerns about your family, your concerns about your children, your concerns about your health, all of it is below Christ. And so I want you to envision, you know, we're, we're kind of getting close to wrapping up here, but I want you to at least envision this moment where you take whatever's heavy on you right now, whatever's burdening you, whatever weighs on you, I want you to just take this, this moment and envision yourself taking, it's like, oh, this is really tough. And you walk it up and you place it at the feet of Christ because he's bigger than whatever you're dealing with. He can handle whatever you're dealing with. It's interesting. I don't think, I, in fact, I know, God's not looking down on your problems saying, oh, man, don't bring that one to me. I can't handle that. That one, oh, oh, man. You know, it's kind of like sometimes with our neighbors. Our neighbor comes over for help. We know he's, he's going to ask for help. Okay, oh, I don't have time to help you with your car right now. Don't come to me. God's not doing that. Anything that we bring to him, he knows it. He can handle it. Our fears, our worries, our pain, our sorrows, he can handle it. One of our, one of our things that we, I think we default to is this idea of control. When we look at Christ here and everything's under, under his feet, who's got control, really? And it's him. But we default to control. It's human nature. Maybe not for all of us, but I think most of us, myself as well. We default, we want to hold on to some semblance of control. And when we lose the control, we lose our security. And when we feel insecure, the wheels come off the tracks. You know, it's like, I can't do this. I can't handle it. Well, Christ's wheels never, in a sense, come off the tracks. He's always in control. So despite who ends up in office on, on, in November, there's still only one person who's in control. Keep that in mind. 
And when Christ, who has been seated in this heavenly realm, he's placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Okay, do you see that? So he's got everything. And we saw it last week with this idea of adoption and inheritance. We see this word here now where he's given everything, the head over everything for the church. So now all that he has to offer, we have these individuals who have been chosen, we have these individuals who have been adopted, and now he says, now you come together as the family, and I have everything that you need, and I'm, everything that's under my feet, I have it for you, the church. You know, it's interesting. Some people are very sour on the church. But if we look at scriptures, there is one way that Christ has chosen by which to present his gospel to the world, and that's to the church. Okay, that's what he chose it to happen that way. That was, it was his choosing, not our own. He chose it. Now, we may not be doing church how he wanted us to be doing it at times. Okay, I'll give you that because we are human. We make mistakes. However, he had designed the church to be his vessel by which to speak to the nations way at the beginning. This was not an accidental plan. This is what he chose. This is what he wanted. And so he has created the church for that purpose. That's what the scripture teaches. I'm a little out of, out of line here with my, my thinking, but that's okay. We're going to move on. I want you to see this in Hebrews 2. So if there's a place where someone has testified, this is out of Hebrews 2, and it's actually referring to, I believe, Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Perhaps we've heard this. This is a psalm, and it's actually speaking about mankind, and it's a beautiful psalm. But now Paul is taking this, and he's attributing it to, to Christ as well. So what is mankind that you're mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. This is mankind that was originally talking about, but he's now attributing it to Christ. Remember that. And putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet, at present, we do not see everything subjected to them. Okay, there are certain aspects. We don't see the full picture. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while. This was temporary, where Jesus Christ was made a man, made lower than the angels for a little while. Now, he's crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So that he's the only one that has to taste death. What an amazing peace to hope for. Suddenly the curtains open, the eyes of my heart can open and see this hope that exists, that perhaps I did not realize it existed. Now I can look out and I can see this hope that Christ has laid out for me and this hope of eternal life with him and not the death. Ephesians 1, verse 23, says, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now catch this in Colossians 2. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. In other words, everything that Christ has to offer you as a follower of Christ have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. You have been brought to the fullness. Everything that Christ has to offer, he's offering it to you and to me and to the church. 2 Corinthians 10. I'm going to buzz through some of these scriptures as we, as we kind of wrap up. I want to hit the last one because I think that's really key for us to grasp and understand. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. This is amazing. Remember way back, first scripture I showed up today, Ephesians chapter 6, all right? Our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual realm. Here it is. For though we live in the world, we do not accept, uh, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. In other words, we look at this idea of we're in this battle, we're in this war, and as soon as we think that we're not in a battle, we're in trouble. As individuals, I think that we're in huge trouble if we lose sight of this fact that we are in a battle, but we've lost sight of who we're fighting against. We're fighting against the spiritual realm. In our own personal lives, when we have habitual sins and such that we struggle with, I just can't get it, I can't, I can't get it, I can't get it. Here we find in, in verse 5 where it says, take every thought captive. That, that's good and that's great. I try to do that. Well, this is so hard to communicate, but the reality of it is you're fighting perhaps with your own tools, your own weapons, if you will, and you're losing sight of who really has the power, and that's the Holy Spirit. And we fight with, with uh, weapons that are not of this world. 
You have the weapon. You have the Holy Spirit. That's the best weapon you could ever have. And we've, we really lose sight of the power that exists in that Holy Spirit. Almost done, I promise. Here it is, 1 John 4. As we conclude, as we wrap up, I, just, I want to emphasize a few pieces, and we're going to look at this scripture together. We are the church, okay? We're, we're individuals who have said yes to Christ. We are the church. We are individuals who have said yes to Christ. We have been chosen by him. We have been adopted by him. And now we as a church, we have a purpose by which to take this gospel that he has given to us because this is the, what he has designed the church to do, to take it to others. But also what we find in the scriptures, the scriptures also are very clear that even as a church, we are to carry one another's burdens, okay? We are, we are here for each other. And sometimes we fight within the church. And I understand there's going to be arguments. But if we're constantly bickering and constantly fighting within the church, we've forgotten who the enemy is. And we're fighting against each other, and that should not be happening. And that's one thing as a, as a parent, I'm not t- throwing my children on the bus here, because I'm pretty sure that all children fi- fight. I fought as a child. Uh, my, my siblings learned that they were always wrong. Um, <clears throat> eventually, I won that over. They still know that they're always wrong. Um, but my children fight, you know? And I, I, sometimes it seems like they hate each other, okay? I'm sure the same looked like when I was growing up. Maybe it's a genetic thing. Some of you probably had, no, I've never had that with my siblings. We always get along really well. I, I envy you for that. Anyway, <clears throat> we have this reality. Okay, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be argument. But... Sometimes we choose the wrong person to fight with. In fact, most times we do. Because the enemy wants nothing more than us as as the body of Christ, as us as the church, to spend so much time arguing and fighting amongst each other that we have lost total sight. We've been blinded by the purpose that he has for us. You know, we're we're initiating these, these small groups. This is not something that we're just decided to do just for the sake of doing it. This is not intended to be just the next flash in the pan. What we have heard from, from people, and I'm, I'm sure a number of you are involved in this, we've heard people are tired. People are, are, in a sense, tired of serving. People are tired and burned out. They're exhausted. And I get that. I understand that. Yet the church can't function without people stepping up and investing, okay? But our heart and our desire with these small groups is this is a place to connect. Because as the body of Christ, we are intended to carry one another's burdens. Okay, I'm struggling. Here I have this group of people that surround me, not only to pray for me, but man, maybe I need help with that roof that suddenly needs reshingling. You know, and that's where maybe Jesus comes, maybe with some flesh on. And next thing you know, you have people carrying one another's burdens that way. And that's this picture of the church. And so our heart with the small groups is this can be a time of refreshing. Where, yes, we, we connect and we, we may build some relationships, but we, we find this opportunity to be open and to be honest and be able to share. My life's not as good as I paint it to be on Sunday mornings. Sometimes I struggle. And it's also this time for someone to come up to someone else and say, oh, man, how are you doing? How can I help you? That's our heart with these idea of, of small groups. We want it to be something that refreshes people that they find that as they're refreshed and find this place that's safe, this place to talk, this place to engage, that they can find, oh man, I love this. I want to serve Christ. Christ has done such a work in me. I want to serve him and then they'll step in in ways of serving. Because not the, the people that are doing so much right now can't keep doing everything and we need more people to serve. But before some people can serve, I understand that some people need to be refreshed. And this is the time to step in. So I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Give some prayerful thought. Is the Lord going to use this to refresh me? We've got some opportunities. This is going to be up for, for several weeks before we, we initiate the small groups. But be prayerful about that. Understand where we're going with that. Because that's what the church is about. Okay? Christ is over it all. So now as we come to him, I want you to look at this passage of scripture. It says, you, this is John writing now, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You see that? The one, when you choose to follow Christ, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And that's what we have to cling to. It's not going to make your life necessarily easy. Everything, snap your fingers, everything's going so smooth. But it does give you a place that you can take these burdens, you can take this stuff, and you can lay it at his feet and say, Jesus, I need you to take this. This is really hard. I can't do it. And then you lay it down. And for some of you who are feeling like, oh, man, I'm not there. I, don't, I, don't, I can't relate to that. Perhaps Christ has prepared you then to allow someone to present to you and you help lead them to this point where they can lay those burdens down at Christ's feet. Do you see that? 
Because just because this doesn't resonate with you, maybe you're, everything's going okay in your life, you're not seeing those struggles, you're not seeing that difficulty, well, you can help someone along that, that is having trouble and saying, hey, let's walk together. Let's take that at Christ's feet. So I'm going to invite Kevin and the worship team to come. Um, can we switch it up, Kevin? Can we do uh, Our God is Greater again? I just I think that, that's fitting for where we, we can conclude today. It's a celebratory song because we have a God who is greater than anything